Greetings, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to our Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations program. Today we learn about the crucial role of coastal wetlands and salt marshes in the absorption of CO2 and the threats that climate change brings to those ecosystems. Our guest is Robinson Fulweiler, Professor of Earth Environment and Biology at Boston University. Dr. Fulweiler is an expert on wetlands and marshes and the impact of climate change on these ecosystems. She'll also describe a current project that includes citizen scientists, so stay tuned. Dr. Fulweiler, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. And I'd like to ask, first of all, for a distinction, if there is one, between a salt marsh and wetlands. Are they different? Or? Yes, so we could spend, I mean, hours <laughs> talking about this. <laughs> so there's no, it's totally understandable that there can be confusion. Yes. Um, so wetland is really like an over-encompassing term, like an umbrella. And then underneath that are all different, lots of different types of ecosystems. So a wetland simply is any ecosystem that has lots of water on it, as you can imagine, a right, wetland, right? right, like right. saturated soils or um, inundated water all the time, like a like a round up um, a, a lake or a pond or something like that. Um, or it could be something close to the coast, something that is more sort of tidally influenced. And so the EPA generally recognizes two broad categories of wetland. There's inland waters, yeah, yeah. um, non-tidal inland waters, and then there's sort of tidal coastal waters. Okay, all right. So, yes. all right. And then uh, marsh? Yes, the so then we can go, yeah, we can go really deep if we want to. But so then marshes really are dealing um, primarily with the type of vegetation that's there. Oh, so okay. if you think about, um, you could have something like a swamp, which might yes. be more like woody, tree-like yeah, organisms. Right. Um, and then in a marsh, you're talking about more like soft stems. So more grasses tend to be dominate. Yes, you can yes. also have small shrubs and herbaceous species and things like that too. Okay. So you're doing some work now, I think, on the uh, the the salt marshes in particular. And I think of that with salt water. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> right? that's right. So wetland could be either one, is right. that right? Fresh exactly, water so think or... of it goes like wetland yeah. and then you could go down between like fresh water okay. and salt water. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. And these marshes, I think, are supposed to be really important. Uh, and so if you could tell us something about that, why they might be important, but and they're fading quickly in yes. some areas, right? Yes. So uh, uh, we'll go into that a bit too, but um, uh, can you tell us about the salt marshes, first of all, like what's in there, and it's an ecosystem, I think. Sure, so salt marshes are these magical places, and I don't know if you have been to one, but you should go if you have oh, not. Definitely. Okay, <laughs> right. this is Massachusetts. That's yes. right, that's right, so, um, so they're, like, we, like I said, they're predominantly grasses, right? Um, but they're homes to a whole bunch of different organisms. And so some of them are there permanently, like mm -hmm. these grasses or mm -hmm. marsh birds mm -hmm. and things like that. Some of them are migrating, so they're really important for like flyover stops yeah. for a whole yeah. bunch of different birds. A lot of um, terrestrial or land animals like to come and feed there, like raccoons or deer, yes. right? Um, um, when the marsh floods during a high tide, you can get fish coming right. um, from the estuary, right, onto the marsh to feed. So they are these really important ecosystems for a whole bunch of different organisms. But it's not just habitat they provide. Um, they also provide lots of different things that we call ecosystem services, which is kind of a term that is sort of fraught. But it, the idea is um, if we had to pay for something, it would like cost us a lot of money, right? But a lot of natural systems provide them just by being there, yes. right? right. So, so salt marshes provide this in the terms of habitat for organisms we're interested in, like we like to watch birds or something, yes. or we like to eat fish. They provide right. the nursery right. ground right. for right. lots Shellfish of them. Too? Shellfish, Shellfish, crabs, all of those things. Um, but they also do things like um, um, help stop storm surge, yes. which is really important. They help protect coasts coast from eroding. Sounds important, right? right it is. Right, right. Um, and then they can also sequester carbon. Um, yeah, okay. And that's also before important. Before that, before mm -hmm. that, let me just check here. I think there are the, the plants and animal kind of configuration yes. is very important also. And I think maybe some of these, I guess they're called grasses, mainly mm -hmm. in these salt marshes. They're very important, but they are threatened also. Is that? 
Sure. True, so but they all are independent. Yeah, yeah. So they're all independent, right? So I think you know, if you think of a salt marsh where it is, right? It's like a ribbon along coasts. Yeah. And so they're really forming these these boundaries between land and sea, and they're made to do that. They're adapted yes. to do yes. that, right? So for the plants, for example, are adapted to be there, um, and they have all really interesting adaptations. If you yeah. want to talk about any yeah, of those, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. okay. So they can they know how to grow essentially um, when their soils are super wet and. Um, and they get flooded routinely. They know how to deal with some amounts of storms and those kinds of things. But when we begin to stress them too much, yes. we move them out of that like zone that they're adapted to, um, and basically we overstress them. Yes, and yes. there might be a question of how quickly they might adapt. Absolutely. It might be if they're able to adapt. I think this has come up with shellfish, the, the, the contamination issue, mm -hmm. the everything issue, but it, just in general, both the plants and the creatures mm -hmm. that inhabit these are sort of uh, vulnerable if they have to adapt quickly. Can you give us an example of like a one or two good adapt adaptations, what you mean? Yeah, sure. So, okay, so if you think of uh, salt, like one of those grasses, like a Spartina yeah. species, which is really common, right? So this grass is living there and it's and it knows it's nose. It knows. <laughs> I do think of things like that. So I'm sorry, I'm I know that's not this. scientific, but that is how I think about things. So pardon we're, that. We're sympathetic. But, <laughs> okay, so if you think of this plant growing, um, what does it have to deal with? Well, if it's gonna get flooded, you know, it might have to deal with the fact that water is not gonna let as much light go mm -hmm, through, so mm -hmm, it's not gonna be able to mm -hmm. photosynthesize as quickly. So what can it do there? Well, some plants have been adapted to grow stems like super quickly. What else? When it's covered with water, it means that there's not gonna be as much oxygen available uh -huh. to the roots of the plant. And one thing that I think we often forget is that plants respire just like us. Yes. So we think right, of them photosynthesizing right. and producing breathe. oxygen, yeah. which they do, yes, and they have to breathe. So if your roots are constantly covered with water, then you don't have access to oxygen as quickly. So they've adapted these neat things like special roots for figuring out how to breathe better. They have some plants, um, like different types of trees, and some mangrove species have something called yeah. pneumatophores, which are like breathing roots that stick up out of the ground like straws. Yes. Um, some uh, of them have prop roots, which can literally like lift them out of the soil a little bit. Um, what else fun things do they have? They, they have a mechanism to actually pump oxygen from their leaves down into their roots. It's called oxygenating the rhizosphere, which is really cool. That is cool. really neat. Yep, and then sometimes they have to get rid of other gases or deal with things. So they have something called narenchyma, which are basically um, these like holes in their stems. So it turns out that plants can actually transmit gases in both directions quite efficiently, and that's like a whole new area of research. What that's a new thing! Mm -hmm. Yes, plants are quite smart. They really, I mean, I yeah, can't say right, that they're right, smart. Right. I know, but somebody smart. recently said, mm -hmm. "If plants are so smart, should we be eating them?" <laughs> <laughs> Don't go down <laughs> that. That's, and you may be sympathetic. Yeah, yeah. You read like omnivore's <laughs> dilemma, and you're like, "I won't eat anything." I can't. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Then, in terms of the other kinds of creatures, are they? Mm -hmm in your mind, very specially adapted also. I see immediately the mm -hmm. vulnerability of these plants mm -hmm. if you have rapid change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the animals are too, and they have a bunch of different adaptations. Different shellfish, for example, um, can do um, very well. Basically, they can seal up, so even though they're exposed like mm -hmm. in the noonday sun, you know, some marsh mussels and stuff, they'll seal up and they'll be fine, even though they would imagine they would be getting like really hot and desiccated, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they're okay. They've sealed up, they've got a little wet inside their shell and enough oxygen there, they can slow down their metabolism and sort of survive through that hot period. So all of the animals there are adapted to sort of how salt marshes function in the long term and what they're exposed to in the long term. That is impressive. Mm -hmm. So then on, you have on top of that the physical aspects of this, mm -hmm. uh, of this kind of system. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us something about that? Uh, so you mentioned there's a, they, they operate as a border there between land and sea and so on, but then other things, and I know that you are an expert on the gases with the, in this <laughs> yes. too, right? That's my claim to fame. Yep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so the physical system is pretty dynamic, right? Because you can imagine in, in a salt marsh, and there's lots of different types of salt marshes, and in and, and, and tropical systems, you might have something like a mangrove, which sort of functions yeah. a little bit similarly. 
Um, but these systems are experiencing like the ocean coming on one way, some of, and, you know, on one end. Some of them are fed um, through different streams and, and rivers that might sort of pass through them, right? So they get fresh water this way and they're getting salt yeah, water this right. way. And, and that the balance kind of of the nutrients and sediment that come in from streams and rivers and then the nutrients and sediments that are coming in from sea are very important. Uh -huh. uh, and you can actually to have different sort of shapes of these systems depending on whether or not you're like at a river delta for a certain mango, mm -hmm. for example, or maybe you're on a coast, like a lot of um, marshes around in New England, for example, not all of them are like next to big streams and rivers. Mm -hmm. Of them mm -hmm. are. So it really mm -hmm. just sort of varies. Right, mm -hmm. right. So they have a lot of variants. And then when it comes to the things like the the gas exchange, because the, the CO2 we hear a lot about right mm -hmm. now. So I mm -hmm. want to ask about that, that sure. they operate as a CO as a carbon sink, mm -hmm. but there are other gases. There okay. Are. Yes, there Take are. Take it away. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so CO2 absolutely is the thing we hear the most about, and that's a very, very mm -hmm. powerful greenhouse gas. Um, there's also methane. So anywhere, uh, basically, if you think about salt marshes, they're this hot spot of metabolic activity, right? They're photosynthesizing like crazy, which means they're producing a lot of food for other organisms, right. including microbes. Right. And a lot of that carbon gets stuck there, which is why they're so good at sequestering carbon or storing carbon for us. But that also means that there's like food there to fuel right, microorganisms. Right, right. And the decomposition of that material that the plants are making um, produces gases. Yeah, uh -huh. And so some of them are other um, powerful greenhouse gases like methane and yes. nitrous oxide. So methane is around 25 times powerful, yeah, give or take yeah. CO2, like molecule to molecule. And nitrous oxide is almost 300 times more powerful. Whoa. Yeah, molecule to molecule. And there's it gets it gets complicated fast because it depends, you know, some some molecules last longer in the atmosphere right, and things like right, that. But right. just in, in general, um, those are sort of two key gases. And then the other one that's not a greenhouse gas um, is N2. So yes, our I atmosphere, think. you're probably familiar, right. our atmosphere is almost 80% N2 or dinitrogen gas. We breathe more N2, right, than oxygen. Right, right, right. Um, and nitrogen um, in salt marshes, salt marshes, another sort of ecosystem service that they, they do is they can sequester and remove nitrogen from the environment and turn it into N2 gas. And that's good because excess, we need nitrogen. Without yes, life, right, there is right. no nitrogen. Our atmosphere, mm -hmm. right. yep. But too much nitrogen causes a whole bunch of other problems uh -huh. like eutrophication and low oxygen I conditions. See losses of biodiversity and things like that. So salt marshes provide the service of, there are a bunch of microbes that live there that do this natural process of converting usable forms of nitrogen to N2 gas, which most organisms can't use. That is fascinating. You see the interdependence, and yes. not only that, then there'd be external factors like uh, heating or oh, an abundant, uh, overabundance of CO2 in an yep. atmosphere, all kinds of things then mm -hmm. weigh in on this system. Absolutely. And again, we're back to adaptation, how mm -hmm. well and how quickly they can adapt. Even little microbes can yes. adapt right. at this rate. Right, and that's a big question, right? Because it's these systems are like defined by change. Yeah. But but at this point, we're accelerating the rate of yes. change so much that we're not giving any of the organisms really time to, to sort of to adapt to that change. And that to me is the worrisome part. Uh, that is very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, just very quickly too, on top of that, it seems to be that the case that there are all these toxins um, invading mm -hmm. the atmosphere, the oceans, the rivers, the everything, they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and those might be having an impact as well. The other one is development Absolutely. along the coast. I don't know if that's a factor of sure. damage. Yeah, absolutely, 100% it is. So one of the ways that salt marshes can adapt to sea level rise, like rising sea level, right, yeah. is in the past they could migrate backwards. Uh, so they could take over a forest, for example, yeah. or a field of some right. sort, like a meadow, right. right? Invade the land. Invade the land. <laughs> but now what we have done is we've put roads and parking lots and seawalls, right. right, all this development, so they run up into a hard bound yes. boundary and they they can't they cannot they migrate can't. over right, cement. Right, right, <laughs> right. right so right. that's a big issue. So trying to figure out how to sort of open up those pathways again, so allowing them to move backwards. Yes. Because again, they're made for adaptation, but we have to give them the space and time exactly, to do that. Exactly, exactly. So that development along the seacoast mm -hmm. is damaging to these systems yes. that are really crucial for preserving the set, the land. Yes, and that, I mean, that's that's the interesting, like that's the yeah, conundrum, right? right? Hello, Hello. Yes. like we rely, I really, um, 
I sort of, I, I don't want to say preach this, but I really think like the future of humanity, like rests in the future of our coastal exactly. systems. Exactly. And, exactly. and so many people live along the coast. Absolutely. We rely on the coast for blue yes. economy. What is it, three to six trillion dollars, yes. you know, comes through the coasts globally. So, I mean, they just, the, we need them. And yet our very presence there can be quite damaging. Exactly. But we can, I think we can live in coexistence. It is possible to do that. Yeah, yeah so. right. But mm -hmm. uh, so you have multiple forms of threats, m multiple threats, the toxins, sure. the development, and then rising and, sea level? Yes, and actually along the development thing too that okay. I hadn't mentioned, right, is that um, when it's not just we put a hard barrier to, right, but we also can change the hydrology or how the water is oh. moving through the marsh. And so marshes need to be able to, you know, they get flooded, but they also need to drain. Right, we don't want to right. let the water pool on there right. for too long. And if we mess up the water flow by putting a road through a marsh, and then we try, sometimes we try to restore it by putting a culvert. Lots of those can, sometimes it it's- worse by the minute. Well, sometimes, right. yeah, sometimes we do it correctly. We, I don't do this, but sometimes we do it correctly and sometimes we don't, right? right. And then we even have, you know, marshes, we have historic um, sort of markings on the land when we ditch them for mosquito control to try to drain the marshes faster or to allow animals to graze on there. Yes. And if you look like uh, aerial photos of most marshes in New England, you can see like the beautiful, you know, when you see curvy lines, you can think like, oh, nature did that. When you see the straight lines, like nature didn't do that. Right, Although right. humans are part of nature and that's another important thing to remember. Anti-nature. Yeah, but yeah. And so you can see that we, you can still see the scarring even though that was done in the, you know, 16, 17, 1800s, we can still wow. see those markings on the land. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. So. And now it's probably gotten worse. I mean, as we it continued right. to develop and uh, spoil mm -hmm. the waters right. and everything. What about rising sea level yes. as well on the marshes? And as you say, they don't have any place to go. They'd go inland right. if they could. Mm -hmm. But Yeah, so sea level rise, that's a... Right. So, I mean, since the 1880s, it's risen globally about nine inches. Wow. And it's accelerated um, over the last, since the 1990s, it's yeah, been accelerating. Yeah, yeah. And here in New England, I'm thinking like since the 1950s, I think it's about four inches oh, wow. increase of sea level yes. rise. So that is a noticeable sort of marked difference of, of what's happening. And that is just the general sea level, yes, right? Yes, That's not right, talking about right. any flooding events yes. or, or adding some tidal cycles in there and getting a huge big yes, tide. Right. So right. that is just kind of like the, the average. Like the, the right. standing sea level, right? right? So that alone would really change these dynamics, the Absolutely. physical and the biological. Mm -hmm. Is that if that's the case? Can they adapt if yes. they if they can't move in right. land? So that's the, something that people are talking about a lot. Now we talk about this like this really sad term of a drowning marsh, right? Essentially, that because it's being inundated so much with water that it cannot photosynthesize and build, because that's how marshes keep, one right. of the ways they do this, right? They photosynthesize, yes. they grow their biomass both above ground their leaves right. and below ground their roots, and that can trap particles, which helps them build sort of peat, but then all of that material at the end of the season can die and senesce right and fall yeah, and build right, up, okay? Right. But if they can't keep that process going because they can't photosynthesize as much because there's so much water, then they then they're literally drowning in place. Yes. And so there are um, restoration efforts underway. So, um, for example, in Rhode Island, I have a student who's working with the National Estuarine Research Reserves, and she um, her name is Nita Nia Bartolucci. She's wonderful, and um, she's working with them to understand how something called thin layer placement um, could potentially help set uh, help salt marshes. And what that is is they put a thin layer of sediment on top of the marsh as a way to help the plants like gain an elevation. Ah. So especially around here, um, this, you know, the sediment that used to come in from rivers because we've dammed them so much, that sediment, it doesn't, there's not enough sediment. Yeah. Um, a lot of, there was lower sediment anyway compared to different areas of the U.S. because of the way the glacial yes. patterns yeah. work. Yeah. But now that we've dammed the rivers, there's even less sediment. And so, so then the marsh is like really the only way for them to keep pace is either to get sediment from like the estuary um, or, and, and to grow. And so if they can't grow enough um, and there isn't enough sediment in the estuary, then we have to help somehow. And so one option is this idea of putting this thin layer of sediment down, which would raise the elevation of the marsh and allow them potentially to keep pace with sea level right. rise. So there are active restoration, sort of experimental restoration efforts right, going on right. right now to see if that works. Right, but you can imagine this This is a lot of work to take care of something that nature would have taken care of if yes. we hadn't done and, some damaging things. But you mentioned the dams. Mm. I, that's another thing that doesn't come out. That has been, the dams have been enormously destructive mm -hmm. to a lot of these ecosystems. Mm -hmm. And I think of marshland, the, 
very famous ones in the Near East, what was in Iraq mm -hmm. between the Euphrates and the Tigris mm -hmm. that went on for 5,000 years and now is being destroyed, period. Yes. You, yep. But, and a lot of that is due to dams, mm -hmm. not entirely, but mm -hmm. tell us about that if you would. What do dams do? Well, I mean, so they stop, so, you know, one of the natural ways that systems work is in the spring, right? That spring freshet will bring lots of water and sediment and nutrients down the river yeah, and right. like flood the, the the delta or the marshes. Right. And so when we stop that, we, we get rid of that source of sediment and nutrients, which can be quite important for the, the uh, for the productivity, the, right, right? right? The downstream productivity. And then of course dams can do things like um, any migrating fish, for example, right? right. They have a hard time right. getting up. Right. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a biological material but also the, and the nutrients mm -hmm. uh, are part of that too mm -hmm. but that's very interesting that that should happen so okay we seem to be a force of destruction so but there are people trying to do uh, something you mm -hmm. know did we cover the carbon sink issue enough here? I want to move to your um, projects, mm -hmm. the, what you are doing specifically. But do we do have we treated this well enough yet? That 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 this operates as a very important carbon sink. Sure. So I think there's a couple things we could just quickly touch on. Um, one, and I don't want to, you know, one thing that is important is that there's a big elephant in the room. So even if we restore all of our salt marshes and our coastal systems, we have to deal with what we're doing to our planet right. in terms of carbon emissions right, right, and, right. and land use change, right? And so right. If we need to, to deal with that. And, and that is both a, an individual thing, but ultimately that's a large scale effort that comes from political will and countries coming right, together right, to right, make right, these right. changes. It's got to be a mass, a planetary it's approach It's a planetary to it. effort. And I, I, I say political not in terms of like politics right, fighting, right, right, right. But, but like exactly. political will of the people right. and, and, and our leaders. And laws. And, and laws that across sort of the thing. globe. Exactly. Yes. And so these um, salt marshes and other vegetated coastal ecosystems like mangroves and seagrasses um, are very important for sequestering carbon. Um, and I think we need all the tools in our disposal, yeah, and they're right. an important tool in the toolkit to fight climate right, change. Right. But they won't be the answer. You know, right. they can't be the answer. Uh, right, I understand. And right, so right, right, yeah. right. And so right. I say that caveat not to like shoot this project in the foot, but just but, to be right. clear that viewers need to to, to realize that um, this can help. Individuals can help. Voting can help. Like ultimately, yeah, we need a help. we need a big force here. Exactly. Change. Exactly. Yeah. The other is that you just don't get a straw and pull that <laughs> that no. carbon out of the atmosphere. Yeah. Uh, that it's there for a very long time yes. in the future, no matter what we do. Yeah, there's now, a lot in the with pipeline. The, with, yeah, <laughs> with the with the the sea level. I'm sorry, the seas are warming, mm -hmm. the land is warming, this mm -hmm. is aggravating all of this. Is that the case? Does that affect the uh, capability of the carbon sink process? It, it does. And okay. so one of the things, for example, this project is trying to figure out, and, and lots of scientists are trying to do this, is to better constrain how much carbon is in, for example, a salt ah, mesh. Yeah. So, and you can think of it, it's like literally like our bank account, right? Uh -huh. So if you think about like how much money do you have in the bank, you've got to get a handle on what's coming in yes. and what's going out. Yes. And um, trying to figure that out is a big effort because we just mentioned, or we earlier mentioned how dynamic these systems yeah, are, right. how much is going on in them, how interdependent they are, and that's lots of vari variability happening both in space and time. Yeah. And so to figure out our carbon budget, it's like trying to figure out your own budget, right? You've got to meticulously understand you know, how much carbon comes in yes. and how much carbon goes out. And in this carbon, we've been talking about CO2, but and we mentioned earlier, things like methane and nitrous oxide yes. add to that because of their global warming potential. So right. we've got to track all of that. And then when we do things like warm up the system, those microbes that are like, they're, they're like, yes. Yeah. You know, when you, when you ramp up the system, metabolism ramps with it, right? So they're, they're like, I'm in a salt marsh and there's all this food around and it's warm, you know, like this is a this is happy place for them. But maybe not so much if they're producing, for us, if they're producing excess CO2 right. and methane. And that's your project? Is that what you are working on just now? Yeah, so this this blue carbon, so it's called blue carbon, right? I, yes, I actually yes, specifically yeah. said that, but anything related to carbon sequestration in the marine environment is called blue carbon. And hot spots for that in the marine system are vegetated systems like salt marshes, mangroves, and seagrasses. And so 
we're trying to get a better understanding of how much carbon is in these systems. And we're really interested in that flux of material. So flux simply means like how much CO2, how many molecules are going into the marsh and coming out. And we can measure that. Um, oh. We're measuring CO2 right now. We're adding in methane. Nitrous oxide is like over here. It's a little yeah. bit harder, <laughs> but someday we're gonna get there. Um, and I think um, our, pro our, our project sort of has uh, two goals, right? So uh, two big goals. So one of them is to try to better constrain how much CO2 is coming into the marsh and coming out of the marsh as literally CO2 gas molecules. Mm -hmm. There's other ways carbon gets in and out. We can talk about that if you want, or save it for another one. But so we're focused on the movement of the CO, of the gas. Um, however, there's a sort of like this other pressing thing that sort of bothers us, and that is that measuring CO2 or any of these processes is quite challenging. I think. And and the um, it's it's for so many reasons: logistically, time, yes, expertise, yeah, yeah, yeah. all of those and things, how. and yeah. how, right? Um, and a lot of the instrumentation to do it is very expensive, and oh. this gets to like a pet. I think it's more than a pet peeve, but um, an, an, an issue sort of in science in general. Yeah. And that is that the, and it, you know, the most well-funded universities and laboratory groups have the money to go do the very best science with the very best instrumentation. And then they get the best papers, and then they get more money, uh, and you see the positive uh, feedback loop. Another but, elite. So it's like technology as a gatekeeper. Exactly. They should have, I'm not saying those yeah, groups no, might no, include it, shouldn't have a, them. We, exactly. Except we would do a better job if this were Right, we cannot um, use technology. Yes, we can't use technology as a gatekeeper, right? So we have this sort of passion to try to understand how can we get sensors into the hands of more people? Because yes. if we could, on the one, just selfishly for like wanting to understand a system, right? right. We would have more data right. to understand these very important systems right. so we could right. build models to forecast how to take care of them. We would figure out how to, um, you know, better restore and manage them so exactly. all those are good. Exactly, but you need that data. But we need those data. And then on the other hand, like, who am I to be the only one asking these questions? Not I, right? But, right? But the sense that like we need to broaden the pool of yes, who can ask absolutely. questions because all the diverse perspectives that are out there. That's right. So That's it would be happens. amazing if we could say, you know, um, yeah, and, and not just in the US, right? We have like long-term dreams of being able to give it to certain like different nations that absolutely. are restoring yes. mangroves or salt marshes and right. being like, awesome, right. here's your sensor right. package right. so you can measure right. these fluxes and get these data back. Right. And I think those things are possible, but, it, and it's not, it could be, you know, college students from non-R1 universities or community colleges exactly. where they're not focused on research, but they have they an interest in it. In Absolutely. This. And it's an education at the 100%. same time. Yes. At the same time. You mentioned the sensors. Mm. I know that you have little thingies to carry around. I know. I didn't bring one. I didn't. I failed to bring oh. them. I know. I know. You can go to coastalocean.org and well, see them. You but... can send us an image, yes, if you will, and sure. I'll put it in the, the, mm -hmm. the video. But that they go around with these sensors. It seems like this is a very important thing to get this data. And I'm not sure that that we in the public have been very well informed mm -hmm. about it. This is no small trick. It's very laborious, mm -hmm. and then you've got to build models, mm -hmm. and we're running out of time yeah, with this. Yeah, so uh, rock, know, don't, the, go, don't the, get dark, the, don't get dark on exactly. me. Exactly, <laughs> no, I mean that, that, that in terms of dealing with the crisis, yeah. understanding these systems to begin with is one thing, mm -hmm. and then dealing with the crisis at hand, mm -hmm. We're, we don't have enough time to fool around. They've got to fund and take care of these things. <laughs> we do. And mm -hmm. citizens can help, or students, or whatever. Absolutely. Yes. So I think, so right now the technology is, you know, expensive. It's hard to move around. takes a lot of expertise. Our goal here is to build something that's um, from off-the-shelf components that's low cost. And then we could, our, so the dream ultimately would be, like a, sh a really like a share economy type of model, uh, yes, right? right? So right. you know, instead of renting your bicycle or your apartment for the weekend right, on the beach, right, right. you can go online and be like, I would like three of these sensors and their little chamber. They come in That's for three months or six months, and we would send them to you, and yes. you could use those. And the deal is, if you use them, then the data is automatically free. And there you, yes. We would, you know, quality but assurance, QA, QC, yes. it, beam it up to the database, right. and there it is. That's right, the dream. Right, right, sort of mm -hmm. like. Uh, just a big international uh, uh, enterprise, the shared yes. data and the whole nine yards. It's really the only way to go. I think it uh, is. Uh, uh, yes. Basically. Mm -hmm. But then 
you are in our last couple of minutes, you're doing this project. Whereabouts is it? And how can people participate? <laughs> sure. And does it work well? Well, <laughs> well, I hope so. So yeah, so right now this is a, um, a nationally science founded NSF funded project. Um, and it's coming to a close, so we are looking for new funding. Um, here's but, your begging cup. So here it is. <laughs> here's my address. So, um, yeah, so we right now have um, um, about eight sensors that are ready to go to and be these shared. Are little things. And they are in a package like this big, yeah. and you need a chamber for them because basically what you do is you put your sensor inside of a chamber, um, which is at this, it's just a, an acrylic tube essentially that is yeah. sealed and gas tight. And then the sensor will sit here and you can close it up for about 10 minutes and it will measure the change in concentration of CO2 over <sighs> time. And then you just pick it up, and as long as we know when you put it down and when you that's and all when you opened it, that's say, all we need to know. You don't have to nope. make a lot of errors. And that's nope. one of There's the problems sometimes with citizen science. Yeah. But you're saying all science, no. actually. Right. Yes. Well, everybody. <laughs> everybody. <okay. laughs> we share that. Yes. <laughs> but the 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 thing is that people could do this. Mm -hmm. uh, they could particip participate, and it will be accurate. And you could be learning this all over the world. That's and the dream. Then everybody would be contributing to saving the planet a wee bit there. That's the dream. I, think. I wish yes. we could go on with Me this. Too. This is really interesting. <laughs> we will have to continue this at another time okay. if you do not mind. Yeah, not at but all. Dr. Fulweiler, I thank you so much for this fabulous information yeah. and I hope people are inspired to get in touch and get out there in the marsh. <laughs> yeah, me too. Thanks so much for having thank me. Thank you. Okay. <laughs>